I'm happy to be here with Father Donald Calway, and he is the Vicar Provincial and Vocation Director for the Mother of Mercy Province of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. He is an Emmy Award winner and the author of 13 books, and he leads pilgrimages to Marian shrines around the world. Father Donald Calway, welcome back. Yeah, good to be back, my brother. Yeah, yeah you, you got good stuff going on on your channel, man. Thank you, thank you. You, you too. Uh, this new book, Father just put out a new book called Ten Wonders of the Rosary, and uh, I've spent the morning in it, and it's awesome. I love it. So well Thanks. done on it. We did a we did a video a while back on um, your previous book on the Rosary. Help me, I can't. I blanked out. What's the name of it? Uh, Champions of the Rosary. Champions of the Rosary with saints, yeah. and yeah. Uh, it's excellent. But this one, everybody, go get this one. This is this is great. I love it. Uh, and you go through here and you give, you know, 10 wonders of the rosary and you talk about, you know, its divine origin. You talk a lot about the rosary as a weapon, the, yeah, the, ro the rosary as a force of grace in the world. And man, that gets me fired up. I try to end every one of my videos with pray the rosary. We got to pray the rosary. It's our weapon, especially as lay people. We take yeah. our orders from Our Lady at Fatima. That's, you know, we can't worry about, you know, what the bishops and all that do our job what she told us to do is pray the rosary yeah and so that's what we you know we faithful we need to do that so why don't we just kick this off and you know let's talk about the divine origin of the rosary we talked about that before i've written on it before there's all these people out there who say uh oh, the rosary was just kind of made up mm. by pious people over time but right. that's not the story in tradition the story in tradition no, is not. remarkable and why don't you share the the original story the divine origin story yeah, and it's I, I love that you said tradition because that's what it is, you know. And um, a lot of times people today, especially like in the last 100 years, they talk about it as uh, a legend. Yeah. And um, you know, I have to say that whenever I hear that word, I, I I get upset because I'm this isn't a legend. I don't base stuff off of legends, you know. Yeah, it's not um, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and Our Lady when she comes and and approved apparitions. She's not telling us, um, you know, pray a legend, pray, pray something based in a legend. You know, it's it's grounded in more than that. And, and it's tradition. Granted, with a small T, it's not on the same level as, you know, dogmas and things. But nonetheless, it's 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 valid. And um, to date, there's never been a pope who has contradicted it, um, even though we've had some pretty, pretty shaky popes, you know. Um, so there's a whole story to this. So in the 13th century. Um, a very holy priest who was from Spain, but he, he was in uh, southern France at that time. We'll call him Father Dominic at this point. He's uh, he's on a preaching campaign to uh, win back heretics, these guys known as Albigensians, who are attacking many of the mysteries of the faith. And um, they, uh, you know, basically held that things in the spiritual realm were good, matter was bad. And so dualist, dualism. And, and they were getting a lot of people away from the faith. Well, this Father Dominic fired up, went out into the streets. Uh, to preach, to bring him back, but he wasn't having a lot of fruit. So um, tradition says he went on a retreat in the forest, and that's when Our Lady came to him, and she gave him the rosary. So she told him specifically to preach my Psalter. So what does that mean? Because that can be a little confusing. So prior to that time, there was a form of devotion to Our Lady in monasteries known as the Marian Psalter. Because there had been something previous called the 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 uh, paternoster beads, where monks who couldn't read Latin um, would say 150 Our Fathers as a substitute for praying the Psalms in Latin. But then, you know, from like Saint Bernard of Clairvaux and a whole bunch of other medieval monks, they um, developed the equivalent in a Marian way, the Marian Psalter. So they would pray 150 Hail Marys. At that time, what was the Hail Mary prayer? So she said, "Preach my Psalter." And tradition says that uh, she gave him the mysteries to preach on, the exact mysteries that the Albigensians were attacking, what we now know as the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious. The luminous would, would come later because the luminous mysteries weren't under attack at that time. So, so he took this out into the streets and used it. He weaponized the Marian Psalter, made it an evangelical tool and a spiritual weapon, and uh, went out into the streets and used it and won back so many people to the faith. Uh, and then he founded the Dominicans, the Order of Preachers, and is known now as Saint Dominic. Um, and the rest is history. It's 800 years now we've had the rosary. It's remarkable because the Manichaean, the Albigensians, were denying, you know, like you said, matter, physicality is evil. 
spirit is good. And so that fundamentally denies the role of Our Lady in the economy of salvation because she is the one who gives birth to Mm. our Lord. You could touch him, you know, you could hear him. He was there. Uh, he, He was fully, he was fully divine, but he was fully man. And so that's the, that's the fundamental target of the Albigensians is that mystery right there, that the word became flesh. And so yep. it's no surprise that the antidote would be Marian, yep. the Marian Psalter, but then attaching it with kind of like nuclear warheads. And that is <laughs> that is the mysteries that right. the people now are, are doing a Marian Psalter, but now they're attaching the New Testament to it. And they're thinking about the stories we see in the Gospels of Mary and Jesus. Yeah, no, well said. And and that's it. I mean, we say that flesh is the hinge of salvation, right? Specifically, the flesh of Christ. Um, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. That's what our Lord says. And and where does that flesh and blood come from? It comes from Mary's flesh and blood. Um, he's not a robot. He's not a phantasm. He's not an angel. He's the God man, you know, has a human nature. And um, that's what they were attacking. So, yes, um, it is interesting how so many of these heresies um, you'll find Our Lady is the one who will overcome them and, and conquer them. And that's why we call her the, the conqueror of all heresies. That's one of her titles, you know. So let's move on here. That's the divine origin. And um, I, I think as, as devoted Catholics, this is we believe this. If, if a yeah. Protestant says, why do you pray the rosary? I think we tell him the story. Right, right. And you know, what's amazing, and you know this as well as I do as a, as a historian, you know, when you go to churches in Europe or South America or whatever, and, and I mean a lot of them, this has been around for a long time, what catechesis are we being taught in art? Is, is Are we being shown legends or are we being shown Our Lady giving the rosary to St. Dominic? I mean, right. are we looking at things that aren't true? Because if that's the case, we've been deceived, brother. I mean, these things have been prayed, saints have prayed before these, popes have laid roses before these artistic depictions of the rosary tradition. So this isn't a legend, this isn't a myth, this isn't a fable or a fairy tale, it's real. And so it's worthy of our belief. Yeah, Our Lady instituted this, she gave it. So it That's is exactly. effectual, yeah. yeah. Now that, we've already, you've already touched on already, but let's talk about the rosary as the weapon. I remember last time we talked, you, to, you taught me something I didn't know, and that is, the reason the religious wear the rosary on their belt actually goes mm-hmm. back to the Crusaders. Mm-hmm. Remind right. us again that story because it's a great story. Yeah, so um, you know, a lot of uh, monks, especially who were in the Crusades, they would wear either the Pater Noster beads or the Marian Psalter on their left side because you know a lot of them, especially if they were monks and in vows, they weren't wielding a sword of steel. Many of them, some were, but not all of them. But the ones who weren't, you know, they decided to to substitute it with this form of devotion. And so, you know, bringing that into the founding of the rosary, the rosary was was born in a time of chivalry, of knights and battles. And so that's why the early mendicant orders with the Dominicans, Franciscans and the others that would follow, when they decided to wear it uh, on their as part of their habit, they wore it on their left side because most people are right handed. You know, most, not all, but most. So you would unsheathe your sword from your left side. And so that was the symbolism of that. And to this day, if you look at almost all, almost all religious, when they have the rosary, it's on the left and for that reason. And didn't you say also that the first historical mention um, of the actual beads and mm-hmm. the rosary is, is in the crusader time or related to yeah. a crusader? What would be called the rosary, yes. Right. Um, before that, it, you know, that, that name was around the rosary, but it wasn't used for that particular devotion. Yep. Um, so it, it, it did develop a little bit. Um, people were a little hesitant at first to use the word rosary, uh, because there were people who were using that word for, uh, immoral practices, hmm. uh, meaning they would go off behind rose bushes and do immoral things. So initially there were people who said, well, should we really call it the rosary? That's being used for something else. Um, so it, the name Marian Psalter stuck around for a little while. It really wasn't until Blessed Alan de la Roche in the 15th century when it really stuck, the word rosary. Yes. And doesn't that relate to the visions of seeing, uh, of the saints mystically seeing, placing a crown of roses, a rosarium, yes. on the head of Our Lady? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and the interesting thing is, um, you know, the rosary was given to St. Dominic and his uh, sons, you know, in, in the Dominicans, but it was a Franciscan novice um, in 1422 that um, he had a vision of Our Lady where Our Lady made it very explicit to him that when he prayed this form of devotion, he was crowning her head with spiritual roses. And so from that point on, it, it kicked in in all forms of Marian Psalters, because there were actually quite a few that were in existence at that time. Um, St. Bridget of Sweden, she actually had a form of a Marian Psalter. The um, Servites, they had one. And today we call that one the Seven Sorrows Rosary. That's got a long history, you know. The, um, so there were all kinds of Marian Psalters. But then in 1422, with that vision, they all became known as rosaries, but they became like the Dominican rosary, the Franciscan rosary, the Corona, the Brigitine rosary, the Seven Sorrows rosary. Uh, and so then, uh, Blessed Alan de la Roche, at the end of the 15th century, he people were like, wow, there's so many options. Which one's kind of the real one or which one's the original? And that's when Blessed Alan de la Roche did a little research in history and said, well, it's actually St. Dominic. And yeah. uh, that became the, the father of all rosaries. Yes. Now, up until I think even the Second Vatican Council, these various rosaries were used by the various orders. And there was a Franciscan rosary. I think people still prayed it. Isn't that right? Yeah, there is. It's the uh, the crown, the Corona the rosary. Corona. It's a beautiful rosary. Yeah. And I was, I was talking to some Franciscan friars of the Renewal, and they were kind of lamenting that one of the reasons why the other variations have essentially disappeared is that when Paul VI changed the practice of indulgences, mm. that those other ones lost their indulgences and only the rosary, the, the Dominican rosary, the one we're discussing, the official one, retained its indulgences. And so therefore, that's the one you do. Is that right? Yeah, it, it may be right. I've heard something similar. I'm, I'd have to do a little research on that, but they may be correct on that because there were a lot of changes Mm -hmm. um, which is a bummer. I mean, when you lose yeah. that, then people kind of put that down and, and don't do it. Um, but, you know, uh, at Cabejo, you know, the approved apparitions are, of Our Lady of Cabejo in Rwanda. Um, Our Lady talked about the Seven Sorrows Rosary and trying to bring that back. Um, so I have to do a little digging on the, on the indulgences thing, but uh, I think that the CFRs or the friars who told you that probably are correct. Yeah, because they were lamenting. They're like, we'd like to bring it back, but... Yeah. We also want to get the plenary indulgence, which is attached right. to Absolutely. reciting the rosary. So, you know, you can, I guess, do both, but there's only so <laughs> much time. So um, what about the Siege of Malta? That's a good story as well. Yeah. Oh, I love that story. I'm actually so excited because uh, I'm going to Malta um, this summer. I've, I've never been. You know, Malta lately has been a place of a lot of drama yep. um so uh hopefully i'll avoid that you know stuff but uh i'm gonna go and i'm actually gonna see some of the things associated with the great siege of malta so so in the 16th century um most people are familiar with lepanto you know when you hear lepanto you just think oh of course that's that's the key one but even before lepanto um there were uh you know ottoman turks and other muslim groups who were seeking to get to rome uh, that was the ultimate goal and kind of still is. Um, and they, they went, they knew that if they went around, you know, Italy and they went up kind of through the West, they could attack Rome. And so Malta was a key Island and, you know, Malta historically, you know, it was St. Paul who was shipwrecked there. You know, you read about that in the Acts of the Apostles. That's where the venomous snake bit him and he didn't die. And people started to worship him. And he's like, what are you doing? You know, I'm like, oh. <laughs> and he, but he, but he brought Jesus to, to the Island so uh, and a lot of other tremendous things have happened there. So uh, before uh, I think it was about six or seven years before Lepanto, there was an army. I think it was like 30,000 uh, Muslims that were going to take the island and use it as a strategic point to get to Rome. Well, there was about 7000 men on the island that were going to defend it. And they weren't even that skilled. But there was one leader. Uh, his name was Jean Parasolt. This guy, phenomenal, man. He goes to a blacksmith. He's not playing games. He's not going to, you know, dialogue about it. You know, he's going to, we're going to pray, but we're also going to, you know, do something a little more than prayer here because we're under threat, um, which makes a lot of sense. So he goes to a blacksmith and he asks him to make him a sword. And he says, I want you to engrave on the sword a rosary. And he did. 
Now, those 7,000 men held off 30,000 Muslims. They never got the island of Malta. That sword is still in existence today, and that's the 16th century uh, at a church. It's a little uh, museum attached to the church in the city of Burgu uh, in Malta. So when I go there this summer, I'm actually, our group is going to go see that sword. So it's going to be awesome. That's gonna be, so it, can you touch it? What's the state status of that sword? I think sword? it's behind glass. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah behind. you need to make a special request. Maybe. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. I want to see a picture of you with it, holding it up. Right. Totally. Right. Yeah. It's so old. I hope it's, uh, you know, strong enough to be held. But um, you can actually do a Google search. You can find it and you, you can see it. OK. Yeah. You know, that, that sort of um, goes against a common misunderstanding in our time is that rosaries are kind of for old ladies. Mm. You know, that's the right. old ladies after mass or before mass. That's what they do. They do yeah. the rosaries and right. and guys, I guess, go smoke cigarettes or whatever. But that's not at all the tradition. No, the tradition of the rosary is is actually, I mean, of course, the convents and the women are doing it everywhere. But yeah. the tradition of it over and over again is you see really mighty men, right? You know, saints, male saints, using the rosary as a weapon, all the way from yeah. Dominic to Padre Pio and Pius V, and it, it has a tradition of battle. I mean, it shares the feast day of Our Lady of Victory, yeah, which refers to military victory not just yeah. spiritual victory. So can you speak to that? I mean, I think there are, there is still this idea that rosary is for old ladies. Yeah, no, there is. And it's unfortunate. And, and it is certainly for old ladies and it is for nuns <laughs> right. and convents, no doubt about that. Right. But again, according to the tradition, who was the f first person that the rosary was given to a man? I mean, that's huge. I mean, that that's a huge statement. And so I think that, um, you know, in my research, cause I, I've written five books on the rosary now, and uh, I just, you know, spent so much time uh, doing this. And I came up with what I called 26 Champions of the Rosary. That's the title of one of my books. And of those 26 champions, I think like 23 of them are dudes. They're men, yeah. you know, popes and, and saints and priests and even lay people, you know, not, don't even have to be a, a saint. Um, but they're men. Now, they're the, been the, the main promoters of it you know, um, many times because they were bishops and they were prominent figures. I think we all know that it's probably women that do pray it more than men. You know, um, how many grandmothers have, you know, interceded for their grandchildren and, and so many other situations. So I, I think there's something to say there about women probably do pray it more than men. But in the history of its uh, promotion, it's been men, bishops, priests and laymen who have, have promoted it and written about it. Um, and that's, I think women would have done the same thing, but we know the history uh, of it. You know, a lot of times the women didn't know how to read and write. That's no detriment to them. It's, you know, thank God we've grown past that, obviously, but that was just how history went. Um, and so they didn't, they promoted it by praying it more than writing about it or preaching about it. You know, women didn't preach, uh, but the men did. And so um, some people, when they saw, I had a, uh, I commissioned artwork on uh, these 26 champions. And when I did, classic, man, some people went off on me. They're like, why aren't there more women in the picture? And I'm like, dude, you want me to just make up stories? I mean, right. I'm doing historical research here. This is the way it went down. You know, I, I got nothing against women. Trust me, the greatest person who ever, human person who ever lived was a woman. You know, yep. all of us men know that women are better than us, but this is just the historical facts of it. You know, um, women pray it more than men, but men have historically promoted it more. Um, so men, I always tell my brothers, man up guys, cause you're, you're, you're not doing what you should be doing if you're not praying and promoting the rosary. That's right. One of the things that's great about the rosary, I think for men in particular, and again, it's for the ladies just as much as for the men, but for the men, you know, we're very, I think we're task oriented and generally, especially in my life, my wife's much better at multitasking than I am. I'm mm -hmm. a single tasker, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. a sequential process most of my day and the rosary is just perfect for that yeah i mean of course you have you're moving the beads but and you're doing the mystery so there's kind of two things there but it's very clear of where it begins where it ends and what i should be doing and i love it for that yeah you i know? do too if you said I... go spend 20 minutes in front of a statue of our lady and pray i don't know it'd be very di it's very difficult for me to imagine doing that but if i had a rosary i could get it done and i think that's that's part of the genius of it it is part of it. I totally agree with you. And I think it's, it's, uh, you know, for men in particular, 
you nailed it because I, if I were asked to go do something that was kind of nebulous, though spiritual, I just get, I wouldn't know what to do. You know, the rosary is perfect for me as a guy. Yeah. Yep. Um, you also mentioned that the rosary is feared by the devil. And mm-hmm. we're, we're in a time now, we're post-Christian, and we're seeing the occult rise up everywhere. We're seeing outright Satanism, but also just things like Wicca and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and we're also seeing a need for more exorcists. Mm-hmm. And the rosary is also a solution there, preventative mm-hmm. and a cure. Tell us about why the devil hates the rosary. Yeah, well, the rosary, I mean, is basically grounded in the word of God. And, you know, as St. Paul says, the word of God is sharper than a two edged sword. It has the ability to pierce through, you know, bone and marrow. It's it's powerful. So the, the rosary is basic, basically the Bible on a set of beads. And you can whip the daylights out of the <laughs> demons with this weapon. It's like spiritual nunchucks. You know, you yeah. can go to town on these guys and they're going to be jumping out windows because when you're praying the Our Father, you're praying the Hail Mary. And that has power, you know, um, as the prophet Isaiah said, or God said to the prophet Isaiah, when I send out my word, it comes back to me yielding fruit. So when you pray that rosary, you're praying the word of God and there's going to be fruit from that. Um, demons are going to be crushed and conquered. Lives are going to be changed. People are going to come back to grace. Virtue is going to be acquired. Um, sin is going to be overcome. Addictions. It's it's so powerful that um, we really do need to emphasize that because you're right. Today, I mean, demons have been unleashed on the earth and and. You know, we, we really need to, to realize that with this short prayer, we can uh, we can overcome, you know, these forces. It's, it is, in a certain sense, like a mini exorcism, the rosary it really is. I mean, uh, the movies, you know, even though they're movies, I am sure that uh, if someone was possessed and you put a rosary around their neck, they're not going to be happy about it. You know, right. the devil knows what that is. <laughs> Yeah. There's this tradition that, you know, in Genesis 3.15, where the Lord places enmity between the devil and the woman. And we know that that woman wasn't really Eve. It was Our Lady, the new Eve. But that enmity is the reason why she's the Immaculate Conception. The devil's got nothing on her. But there's also this tradition that the devil really, really is afraid of and hates Our Lady because, you know, he was the highest angel, but now she's the highest creature. And and she superseded him by by so far and i think that really hurts his pride because he's he's prideful right and do you think that's one of the reasons why the rosary is so hated by him it's a mystery of the incarnation but it's a devotion to the lady who outdid him yeah i think so and once again as you alluded to earlier um it's the rosary is grounded in incarnational mysteries those mysteries of the flesh and satan's not into the flesh you know he'd rather see it destroyed um, so again, grounding it in that fleshly reality of an incarnational religion, um, that's huge. And that's why Satan, yeah, that's why he hates it. Yep. You know, you as a priest hear this a ton. I hear it some just as a, a Catholic teacher, but you know, so-and-so, my daughter, my son, my uncle has left the church or, you know, my spouse or whoever, how, what can I do? What, what book can I give them? What DVD can I give them? What CD can I give them? Right. And all of those things are important. I'm not discounting that. Part of what I do is part of what you do. You know, we're, we're making books, we're making lessons. So that's very mm-hmm. important and key. But the rosary, if you leave out the rosary, it seems like you're kind of undermining your whole task. Like the power mm-hmm. of conversion yeah. in the rosary. Can you talk about that? Conversion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. I think I've got, there's a great quote in the book um, from St. Louis de Montfort. Um, about that, he says something uh, that basically he says in his book, The Secret of the Rosary, which is the greatest book ever written on the rosary. You know, I mean, yes. that guy is phenomenal, a league of his own. Um, he says that, dear reader, uh, I'm going from memory here. Dear reader, I promise you that you will gain more by praying the rosary than from reading any spiritual book. I mean, that that's and that's a powerful statement. Now, and why could he say that? Because when you again, when you pray the rosary, you're praying the word of God. How are you going to do better than that? You're, you're really not. And so if you um, are seeking to bring a loved one back to the faith or, or trying to give them good material, that's good. That's good. That's great. And we need to do that. But it definitely needs to be grounded in prayer. Um, and if you can get people to take the time to meditate upon the saving mysteries of Jesus 
and pray those anointed words from the scriptures, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, the Holy Spirit's going to do his work. You know, we don't have to be, because I'm not Fulton Sheen. I'm not as articulate as Fulton Sheen. I can't put it in pithy little statements like he did, you know, and that's okay. You know, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, you, don't, you don't have a cape? Like no, Fulton I Sheen. don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, I do. I'll okay. be honest with you. We'll try I it one day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I've got that would be one. hilarious. <laughs> oh, yeah. When I was in seminary, I, I got one of these mm. kind of capes that they, the priests would yeah, wear sure. in like 40s or 50s. But uh, it just didn't look quite right. I thought, you know, this is a little odd. People are going to think it's Halloween or something. Right. You know, they, they're not going to understand what I'm doing. So it's in the closet. Um, but the rosary, yeah. I mean, it's it's that uh, the, allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and to really move a heart and a soul in ways that we're not going to be able to do that. We're not God. But uh, if we if we give him that ability, teach people the rosary, it can happen. Yeah. Tell us. A, can you tell us a story about the devilish Italian lawyer? Oh, I love this guy. I love this guy. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, just a little over a hundred years ago now, there was a guy named Bartolo Longo in uh, Naples. And uh, of course he grew up Catholic. You know, I mean, he was in Naples. Uh, but then he went off to college and unfortunately he left the faith. You know, he was, it was a time of uh, real nationalistic movements in, in Italy and he got swept up in that and he left the faith. But he was still searching, so he had some friends who were going to seances, and they were doing all kinds of weird stuff. So he went with them, and he thought that it gave him meaning, you know, and purpose and power and influence. And uh, he got so wrapped up in these that he actually became an ordained satanic priest. I mean, that's <laughs> – you can't get any worse. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Right? Yeah, I mean, it makes me look good. I did a lot of bad yeah. things, but, I, you know, I, I, I never did anything like that. Um, and what was the fruit of that? It led to depression, anxiety, and even thoughts of suicide. It was horrible. So eventually, after a period of time, he broke down, and he humbled himself, and he went and he found a priest. And uh, thank God, he found a Dominican priest. And the Dominican priest told him about the rosary, right? Thinking what we just said. This priest could have probably given him a ton of books, right? Dominicans especially could have given him some really good stuff on grace and all, yeah. you know. But it wouldn't have been the right time. So... What he told him was the rosary. So this man, Bartolo, completely bought into it. And he said, this is my way out of the, the occult. So he renounced the occult. Um, he became a third order Dominican himself, took the name Brother Rosario, and had a massive conversion, massive conversion. Ended up um, rebuilding this destroyed city of uh, Pompeii, you know, Vesuvius in the third or fourth century, whatever it was. Nothing had been done there since then. And so he rebuilt it, and he built, started building a shrine to the Rosary, Our Lady of the Rosary in Pompeii, which is probably one of the most beautiful churches in the world. Have, have you ever seen that? I haven't. Oh my goodness! That when I but walked that's into the same that, one I, that Padre Pio was devoted to, right? Absolutely. Yes. That's a, yes. It'll blow your mind. I mean, I went there only once. I walked in, and I was like, I don't want to leave. I mean, there's so much to see. There's so much. It's like just a powerhouse. And that church is so important that it's actually its own diocese, the church. Serious. Yes, the church it's a, it's is its a, own diocese. It's its own diocese. It has its own bishop. It has its own bishop right there. Yeah, wow. it's amazing. It's a pontifical basilica, its own diocese with its own bishop. So he he did that. Uh, so Bartolo he, was there anything there before? No, there wasn't. So he there just said, nothing. "I'm going to go and build yeah. this cathedral diocese." Yes, yeah. that's the exactly power of the rosary. Did. Yeah, right. And um, a lot of people were skeptical, super skeptical, because they're like, this dude used to be in the occult. What's he, you know, what's going on here? And um, even some of the, the higher ups at the Vatican were skeptical. Um, but thank God, guess who was the pope at that time? Leo the 13th, right? That Love guy it. was all about the rosary. Love it. Yeah. So when, when it was near completion, Bartolo Longo handed it over specifically to Leo the 13th. And Leo the 13th was like, wow, this is a great gift to the church. Um, so I think that Bartolo Longo died in 1926, um, and then, incredibly, the guy who was a former satanic priest is now blessed Bartolo Longo. He was uh, beatified in 1980, I think, by John Paul II. I mean, that's incredible. This guy needs to get sainted. Right, totally. And yeah. people need to know about him, because yes. I have so many people come up to me and they say, Father, my son or daughter is involved in the occult oh, in some yeah. fashion. And I tell him about this guy, and I'm like, you have a friend in heaven who can help. Yes, you know? this is the patron saint of those 
who have yeah. dabbled are in the in the occult or all the way in. Yeah, yeah. Think about it. The Ouija board today. How many oh we, people make movies about this craziness, and so many other things, and things that are not necessarily uh, explicitly the occult, but they're real close. You know, like yeah. yoga yep. and Tai Chi and Reiki. No, I, and all I stuff. talk about it, Father. And people get mad at me, but I talk oh, about it. Tell me about it, brother. I'm like, stay away from <laughs> that yoga and all the. Oh. <laughs> Don't get me started, <laughs> you know? know? Just talk to some exorcists, folks. They'll right. tell you. They'll right. tell you. So let's talk about Leo the 13th. I love Leo the 13th. You love Leo the 13th. Every time I go to Rome, I visit his tomb. Every time you go to Rome, you yep. visit his tomb. Before we start, I was saying, I visit Leo the 13th because I used to be an Anglican priest. And he's the guy who said Anglican priests aren't real priests. I read mm. his encyclical, Apostolic Curie, mm. and uh, eventually I became a Catholic, um, Catholic layman. So I have that that I owe to him. But I also love that he wrote, is it 15 encyclicals on the rosary? I think it's 13. 13. Yeah. yeah. Who's counting at that point, right? I mean, he, this guy is writing <laughs> encyclicals on the rosary yeah. like every quarter. <laughs> he is the Pope of the rosary, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. And and why does, what's the origin? Do you know the origin of his devotion to the rosary? Why is po why is he the Pope of the rosary? Yeah, one, one of the reasons, there's, there's, uh, several reasons. One was um, he was very familiar before he became Pope with uh, Our Lady of Lords, um, and Our Lady of Lords came with the Rosary in her hand and prayed parts of it with Saint Bernadette, so he knew that. But then also he's the Pope who beatified Louis de Montfort. Mm. So when that process was going on, all of Louis de Montfort's writings had just recently been rediscovered in that chest in France. It was buried in a field. We gotta, uh, we gotta do that story too. Keep going. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. No, it's incredible, yeah. right? So, um, so he was part of that kind of investigation, reading. Okay, what's authentic? What may not be authentic? And so, one of those writings was the Secret of the Rosary. I mean, the best book ever written on the Rosary. So he was involved with that and knowledgeable about that. And then he beatified Louis de Montfort. And so, when he began his pontificate, the Rosary was just like a major part of it. And um, I say in one of my books, uh, I did a lot of research on him, and he grew up uh, in, in kind of uh, on a farm, basically. And he was aware that harvest time was in the fall. So that's why all, almost all of his encyclicals on the rosary were put out in October, um, because he knew that that's harvest time. If you want to reap a harvest of souls, you need to promote the rosary. And to make that not just one day in October, October 7th, the whole month. He turned October the whole month right. into the month of the rosary. He's the one who did that. Wow. And yeah. he's, he's seeing it as saving souls. That's right. That's yeah. Incredible. Yeah. All right. Tell us the story about uh, the box in the book in the field, the lost yeah. works of, of um, San Louis de Montfort. Yeah. So, um, you know, what's sad is um, this guy never had any of his Marian masterpieces published during his life. You know, the true devotion to the Blessed Virgin, secret of the rosary, the secret of Mary, never published. Nobody was interested. Um, I mean, it was a time certainly of, he had cop someone read the co copies of it or read the original, right? He they did. He shared it with someone. Yeah, they did. But what happened, you know, right after his death was the French Revolution. Right. So, you know, in a certain sense, I'll be honest with you, it's so we can almost be grateful that they were buried in the field because had the authorities of the French Revolution found them, they would have burned them. Yeah. You know, yeah. We, we wouldn't have it. Um, so God has a way of working through things. But um, his religious community that he founded, one of them, um, they wanted to promote it. Um, but the leaders of the French Revolution, you know, they were really right on their tails. And, and they didn't his community didn't flourish at the beginning. They only had like a couple members. And so I think it was like for 150 years, uh, almost all of his writings were were buried in a field in France and they weren't discovered. I don't think it was until like around 1846 or something like that. And somebody came upon it and they're like, what's this? <laughs> you know, and it was like an unbelievable discovery took place. And then um, they began to be translated uh, in, uh, into different languages and published. And what blows my mind, and this is incredible to me, the first English edition of uh, The Secret of the Rosary was not published until I think it was like, 1940 or something like that that's wow. crazy that is crazy <laughs> it's brand new still because, yeah because i mean, I know some people who have read it 
Yeah. It's a popular book. Totally. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's just in time for the Immaculate Conception, too. 18, mid-1800s, too, that that, that that came, that discovery was made. So that's remarkable. It is. It is. Yeah. That would be like Father Calloway dies, and then one day someone finds a thumb drive, and there's like the 10 <laughs> extra books that, that, <laughs> that you wrote, right? Oh, I'm, i got to break that thumb drive. Some of my stuff is not worthy of reading. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, but Leo the Thirteenth. I just to go back to him. Um, if you want to visit his tomb, it's at the ladder at St. John Lateran. Uh, you right. go up to the main altar and hang a left. That's there's a big right. statue of him right there. But uh, there's also an interesting uh, video on YouTube. Have you seen the video of him on YouTube? Oh, praying the Hail Mary, right? Isn't isn't uh, he saying? I, I don't I can't. I know he he gets. He's like getting on a carriage. It looks like a Charlie oh. Chaplin movie. It's like <laughs> yeah. you know, like really slow. You know. And there's, yeah. it's a, there's no sound, but right. it's the first video footage of a Pope ever. It's Leo the 13th. And yeah. uh, it's kind of interesting to watch, but he looks very frail and small. And actually it was the little flower. She's the one she met with Leo the 13th, I believe. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. she said, remarked to her sister that he looked like he was about to die or something like that. Do you know that quote? <laughs> I do. And he was an old guy. <laughs> he was very yeah. old. He was very old. He fought it to the end. Um, yeah, so what a great pope. And do you recommend people reading his encyclicals? Are they relevant oh, today? Oh, they're so relevant today. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's like they were written yesterday. Yeah. You know, what I wouldn't do to have a document like that written today. Mm. Kidding me? Yeah. I mean, with clarity and conviction and power, you know? Oh, man. Take me back 100 years, man. Yeah. Or, you know, I'll tell you, if I could live in one century, I'd go back to the 13th, which is when the rosary came. Right. With Francis and Dominic yeah. and Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas and right, right. Paris and all that. Yep. That's a great century. But we're here. Yeah. It, <laughs> we're, it we're is just, what it is. We're in the century. Another uh, blessed that I really love is Maria Agreda. Maria mm -hmm. of Agreda. Um, there is devotion to her down here in Texas because she bilocated to Texas. That's right. Um, and there's... Um, I believe down in San Angelo is where uh, where she would appear, and I think there is some sort of a mural or or some something that commemorates her there. Our state flower is the blue bonnet, and it's in honor of Maria Agreda. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah, our huh? state flower because she wore a blue uh, mantle. That's right. And, yeah, and it said that when she would appear here and catechize the Native Americans, when she left, there'd be blue bonnets left behind, huh. which they associated wow. with her. Her, yeah. blue, her blue mantle. So yeah, that's our state flower. So, but most people I bet right now watching 90% of them have never heard of Maria Agreda yeah. and why she's important to the rosary. So share that with us. Yeah. So um, she was a nun in Spain in the uh, 17th century. And, um, you know, her kind of claim to fame is the uh, mystical city of God, you know, um, which is the kind of the hidden life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it's a masterpiece. I it's mean, awesome. It's four it's, volume. It, you got the four volume? Is. Yeah. Don't get yeah. the abridged one, folks. Get the four volume. That's right. That's right. My wife said, whenever I can't sleep, my wife says, well, get the blue Maria <laughs> Greta. And I just read that and I fall asleep. That's there my sleeping Make pill. A paragraph, yeah. Yeah. It's so peaceful. <laughs> yeah. You read it, you just kind of fall asleep. It's beautiful. It, it is. It's absolutely beautiful. So um, before missionaries had come to what we today call the, you know, the Southwest of the United States, especially Western Texas and um, New, parts of New Mexico, um, this tribe of Indians um, claims that they were having visits from a woman dressed in blue. And then um, she was teaching them the faith and she was telling them that Catholic priests are going to come and they're going to give you the sacraments I've been telling you about. And so when a few years later, the missionaries came up through Mexico, they came upon this tribe that already knew the faith. And they said to them, we've been waiting for you. Uh, the lady in blue told us you were coming. We're ready, you know, and the tribe already had in their hands rosaries. So the Franciscans were like, what is going on here? You know, this is, <laughs> this is a little sketchy. So, but back then the missionaries kept really good journals, you know, because they were, they were not only commissioned by the religious communities to, you know, go to the new world, but also by the king and queen of Spain. You know I mean? These were also secular endeavors. And so right. they were sending back their journals about maps. this. Everything. Yeah. And so 
they were like they were thinking initially that they had seen apparition of, of the Virgin Mary. Right, because Lady in Blue, you would think, oh, it's Our Lady. Seems like a no brainer, right? But then um, after some time, the the Indians they said, no, 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 it's not the Virgin Mary. We know who she is. The woman in blue told us about her, but it wasn't the Virgin Mary. So after a period of time, there was this famed mystic in a convent in Spain named, you know, Mary of Agreda. And she had the ability to bilocate, you know, um, which basically means that you can be in multiple places at the same time. You know, like Padre Pio could do this. St. Faustina could do this. Many saints could do this. Or God, you know, did it for them. Um, so she was being sent by God to a place she had no idea where it was. And she was teaching them the faith. And in her convent in Spain, they made rosaries. So she was like, well, we, we have excess. I'll just take some with me, you know. And so she gave them to the Indians. That's how they had them when, they, when the missionaries came there. And they showed the Indians at one point, like a drawing, if you will, of Mary Bagrita. And they said, that's her. And then she herself kind of fessed up to it. Yes, it's me. I've been going to these people. Um, so it became known. And uh, that's, uh, that's also not a legend. You know, that's a tradition. And it's yeah. verified. Um, and it's been approved. I mean, everybody knows about this in, in, in you know, circles in the church. Yeah. Two other great stories to, to, to back up on the ones that you put there is um, when one of those missionaries went back to Spain, and he, of course, was trying to figure out, trying to connect the whole thing together. And he met with Maria Greta. She told him the day that you baptized however many Indians at that river with the tree that looked like such and so, I saw that. And he remembered it. And so that's how he knew wow. that she was being able to bilocate and seeing what was going, going on with that tribe. Another great story that is related there is when, the, when they came and presented the gospel to them, which they already kind of knew. Yeah. I, I had heard that they basically already knew the Apostles' Creed from her catechesis, okay. right? And then yeah. when he they asked the tribe who wants to be baptized, everybody raised their hand, and the mothers raised the hands of their infants for them. <laughs> that they were ready. Yeah. And they even knew that they needed their bap their babies baptized as well. So yeah. it's a pretty neat story, and I, I encourage everybody, get the Mystical City of God 4 volume. That's mm -hmm. her having mystical visions of the entire life of Mary. Mm -hmm. It's almost like one of the four gospels, but it's just recounting the history of our lady from her immaculate conception all the way to her coronation. And it's, yeah, it's beautiful. It is beautiful because you've also got stuff in there uh, about St. Joseph, mm. you know, which is great. I mean, we need more on him and, and there's little hidden gems in there on him as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a, it's a great, a great book. So, uh, I had not heard that about her distributing the rosaries before. I had not heard that yeah. tradition, so yeah. so I'm glad to have learned that one. Um, what about the Spanish gypsy that takes a bullet? Oh, yeah, this guy. So um, this wasn't terribly long ago. You know, Spain was going through a lot of turmoil, and um, there was this gypsy in Spain, uh, Blessed uh, Seferino uh, Mala, I think is his name, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So he was very devoted to the rosary, and um, the priests in Spain at that time were being persecuted, and they were being incarcerated and sometimes even killed. And he stood up for a priest. He defended a priest, which meant that um, he was um, being interrogated by police and being threatened to go to, to prison. And when he was there, he had a rosary in his hand, and the guards saw it, and they said to him, you know, get rid of this stupid thing. And he said, absolutely not. And they said, give us that. And they tried to take it from his hand for forcibly, but he didn't. And they threatened him uh, that they were going to shoot him unless he handed over his rosary. And he said, absolutely not. I will never surrender my rosary. So they shot him and, and they killed him. Um, but now he's a blessed of the church. He was um, beatified by uh, St. John Paul II. And um, the homily that the Pope gave for that beatification is really incredible because he calls him a martyr of the rosary, this blessed Seferino, this gypsy. And then after him, um, Benedict XVI, maybe it was on his feast day or something, he also gave a homily about blessed Seferino and reiterated that he is the martyr of the rosary. So pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, you talk about in this book, ro the rosary changing world history, mm. changing the courses 
Um, there's a story in here. Uh, it's called "Routing a Communist Leaning President in Brazil." Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us that one? Yeah, I love that one because I, I actually, when I was doing my research, I didn't know about that. You know, I, I discovered so much in putting this book together, um, and that was one of them. And I, you know, it's funny because I almost challenge people. If you look at your nationality, you know, wherever it is you came from, your people came from in the old country or whatever, um, I almost guarantee you, you're going to find a story of old ladies in the streets or in some fashion praying the rosary to overcome some, you know, dictator or a leader who was oppressive or whatever. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. So um, in the last century, um, Brazil, which is, you know, a, of course, a huge country, there was a guy who was making his way up to the ranks in the, in the political system, and he wanted to turn the whole country into a communist country, uh, a little bit of socialism, a little bit of communism. And, and he was having rallies in the major cities um, in, in Rio and in Belo Horizonte and a whole bunch of these places. And he was really getting the people um, convinced of his ideas. Well, thanks be to God, these ladies rose up. And they took it to the streets and they started to gather these huge rallies to pray the rosary in the exact same cities that the communist rallies were taking place. And on one key one, key one I think it was in the city uh, Belo Horizonte down there, they had so many people praying the rosary that it was louder than the communist uh, rally with their megaphones and everything. They had it had to shut down. The, the guy who was the up and coming president was in a panic and he actually fled the country. Um, and so it never it never happened. It, and, and everyone, if you talk to Brazilians, um, they'll, they'll tell you the story and how it went down, because even non-Catholics were in the streets praying the rosary. Really? Yeah. yeah I've, I've actually noticed it's I've always thought that a Protestant would be opposed to the rosary, but I've known I've known over the years protestants who do pray the rosaries and sometimes you know we do a family rosary rosary in the evening if there's someone who's over who's not a catholic i'll yeah. say you want to pray the rosary and they'll say sure and one of the kids runs over a set of beads wow. and uh sometimes they pray with us yeah and that's it, remarkable it is remarkable it, it it reminds me that we don't need to be ashamed of the rosary we don't need to be embarrassed we don't need to think oh this is this is something that's kind of loony or you know yeah. secret catholic only only if you're really catholic you know about it it can be a tool. Like you said, Protestants showed up at this thing and they took a rosary yeah. too and they started praying the rosary. Right, so right. Don't, don't underestimate it. No, right. And you know what's interesting? Saying that, that reminds me. So the book, right, the foreword is by Bishop Athanasius Schneider, who's like, yeah. Yeah, two thumbs up, three thumbs so, up. Right. Yeah. Absolutely, brother. This guy, oh, yeah. I love this guy. He's, he's so, appropriately named Athanasius after St. Athanasius. Kid. You ain't kidding. Oh, my goodness. I love this guy, man. He's on fire. So when I was thinking about, man, who could I get to really kind of give a little oomph to the book? You know, I just rolled the dice. I said, you know what? I'm going to ask a few priests I know um, if they have his email. And it was um, Father. Uh, do you know Father Rick Heilman up in Wisconsin? Great guy. Yes, I know the name, but I don't know him. Yeah. Roman Catholic man is his site. Yes. I think he's, mm -hmm. he's fired up. He's a yep. great guy. So he said, Oh, here's his email. Get, you know, check, try it. So I did. And I sent him the manuscript and he, he wrote back and he said, I'd be delighted to write the forward. So I was like, wow, this is out of control. But in the forward, he says, and I didn't know this, you know, he lives in Kazakhstan, but his last name Schneider, he's of German descent. His father was in a gulag in the former Soviet Union in a hard labor camp. I didn't know that, right? Yeah. What I also didn't know, and he put it in the forward, is that his father and many of the others in the camp, including Lutherans who were in that camp, prayed the rosary every morning on the way to their place of work. And he said that the Lutherans would join in especially because when it came to the last part of the Hail Mary, where they said, now and at the hour of our death, he said they would all shout it out really loudly because they didn't know if they were going to survive through that day. It could have been that hour. That's right. So it was Catholics, but also Lutherans praying it. And uh, he talks about that in the forward. Yeah. I credit my conversion to Catholicism partly to the rosary and to Our Lady, because as an Episcopalian priest, I used to pray the rosary. In mm. fact, I remember going to Planned Parenthood with other Episcopalians to 
pray in front of the you know abortion mill. And of course, there are already Catholic priests and Catholics out there. They were praying the rosary. Yeah. So I started yeah. praying the rosary. Yeah. And That's so you awesome. never know. You never know. Uh, that the rosary is, it's like a net. You know, you can catch catch fish with it. It is. It absolutely. It kind is. of relates uh, to the the one fifty three in John's gospel. That's right. I I read that some years ago, and I was like, boy, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Father's talking about how in John's gospel, when they catch the fish, they count them. It's one hundred and fifty three. How many hail marys are in the traditional rosary? Yeah. One hundred fifty three. One hundred fifty for the fifteen decades, right. and then the three. Which are your yeah. intro, right? Intro ones. When did that tradition of adding the an Our Father, three Hail Marys, and and a, a Glory Be before the Psalter? Does that go back to Dominic? I don't think it does. Where does that? Get no. Attached? Yeah, there's been quite a few developments, and th and that's one of them. So there's several kind of stories about the origin of that. But when the Rosary began to be uh, indulgenced. You know, to get an indulgence, you have to do certain things like pray for the intentions of the Pope, um, you know, uh, receive Holy Communion either before or after a short period of time, go to confession. So in order to get those indulgences, people started to pray a few Hail Marys before they actually got into the decades of the rosary. So then they just started to make the rosaries that way. Well, everybody seems to be doing this. Let's just do it. This added in to the making of it. Now, it's interesting in Europe, in some countries, not everywhere, in a few, um, I think in Austria, for example, the people there pray those three at the end. Uh, yeah, they don't they don't pray it at the beginning. Many of them. Um, they'll so they pray just start. The they just start at where the three strings meet and they would just pray in our father there to begin. Uh, I'm not even sure that they do that. I think they pray the creed. And then they go right into the mysteries. Right. So they'll start oh. with an Our Father like we would with each decade. Yes. Okay. But the Our Father and the Hail Marys, the, sometimes they say for the end to get the... So they, they use it as a tail. Yeah, in yeah. a certain sense. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and huh. I didn't know that until a sister who was from uh, Austria told me. She said, Father, you know, in our country, in many places, we pray that at the end. I said, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's legit. Yeah, it, it yeah. gets it done. <laughs> um okay let's let's get politically incorrect and talk about islam <laughs> okay you have a, i was pleased to see that you have a section on there in this new book and again for those maybe just tuning in 10 wonders of the rosary father Kawe's excellent new book uh, you talk about the the role of the rosary in overcoming islam and if you go all the way back to the 600s or you read someone like saint john damascus he's saying that Islam is a satanic corruption of Christianity. Mm. In other words, they revere Jesus Christ. They talk about Our Lady, but they deny that He is the Son of God. Right. Right. Yes. It's, it's it's a it's a form of Arianism, mm. in a sense. They think that Christ is just a human. Right. Oddly enough, they believe that He has no human father, but mm. they don't say God is His father. Right. So it's 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 a jumbled up mess, and it is an attack against Christ and against Our Lady as a religion. And so kind of going back to Dominic, who was fighting against the Albigensians and them misunderstanding the role of the incarnation, that the Lord became flesh. Islam has the same, in a different way, has mm -hmm. the same problem. They don't see mm -hmm. Jesus as the Word made flesh right. or Mary as the mother of God. So it would make right. sense that this devotion also would be helpful when encountering Islam. So maybe Absolutely. tell us some stories on that. Oh, yeah. No, this is that's why on the cover of the book, I got um, the scene from the Battle of Lepanto yes. that was commissioned by Leo the Thirteenth, and is in the uh, Vatican Museums to this day. Every time I go through the Vatican Museums, I look up and see it and look at it. And that's why I wanted this image. Where so, I've never seen this in the Vatican Museums. Where, whereabouts is it? OK, so, when you know, when you are in that long line to go in to the Vatican Museums. Yep. If you're going through, it's called the the uh, Chapel of the Candelabria. So there's a whole bunch of candles and light fixtures. Mm -hmm. um, after you get through all the naked David statues and the beheaded, you know, <laughs> Greek whatever, right. um, you come into this place. It's up on the ceiling. So you have to be looking up. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. A lot of people miss okay. it. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's awesome. And is, it I is. guess depicted there is the an angel of like a victory or something? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that's Don Juan of Austria, yes. uh, who's, you know, the one at the Battle of Lepanto. So, And can I just oh, say yeah. something on that, Father? 
Don Juan, you know, historically wasn't like the most saintly guy in the world, was he? No, he wasn't. Yeah. But, but yet God chose him. That's right. That's right. And I think and, we need to be mindful of that in our time, that there are there are people out there, men and women, who may not be the holiest, you know, saintliest person that you know, but yeah. God can still use them as an instrument for his his purposes on earth. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's no question about that. And even, I mean, one of the other people that was at the Battle of Lepanto, um, James Cervantes, right? Yes. Wrote Don, Don Quixote, right? I mean, he's Spain's basically greatest author. Yeah, he's like their Shakespeare. Uh, yeah, right? And he was at the Battle of Lepanto, and he wrote about it, and he actually took a serious wound that he had for the rest of his life there. And he said, there's never been a battle like this, and there probably never will be. You know, um, so anyway, you're right. God can use anybody. So Islam. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I probably have to go on the run after this video, you know, but uh, it's <laughs> it's it's false. I mean, Muhammad is not the savior of the world. You know, he's not on the same level with Jesus. Jesus is God. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people that get really upset with me when I say this, that I'm not being good at, you know, ecumenism and whatever. Look, I'm not out to hurt anybody. I'm not an Islamophobe, you know, or anything like that. That's, that's crazy talk. But I have to be who I am and faithful to Jesus Christ. And as, and as a Catholic priest, you know, Muhammad did not receive a true revelation. It was a deception. It, it, was. Was, it was a deception. And so, you know, will that offend people? Sure. But, you know, if I if I start saying that it's on the same level or it's just as legit as Christianity, what? Am, why did I make a vow of celibacy? What, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? I'm, right. It's not. So, but the interesting thing about it is it does have some elements, as you say, of Christianity in it. So, it, it, sure, it mentions Jesus, although it denies his crucifixion. It says basically another man took his place at Calvary, yeah. which is insane, right? Um, but the only woman that is mentioned in the Quran is not Muhammad's mother, not his wife, or many of his wives, or you know, what? It is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it also, there are three of the mysteries of the rosary that are actually in the Quran. Um, you've got the visitation, you've got the incarnation, although they don't see it as God becoming flesh, you know, but it's the, Mary giving birth to Jesus. Um, and one of the other ones, another one, which I forget at the moment. And it's, it's fascinating because, you know, Muslims have a prayer that they pray on a string of beads. It looks almost identical to the rosary, yes. minus the crucifix. Really. Now, what they're praying is what they say are the divine names of Allah. That's what they say that they're they're doing and they're invoking those. Um, OK, you know, what would be so easy to do is get them focused on the sacred saving mysteries of Jesus Christ. The only way to the father, it would be an easy transition for them. Just put a crucifix at the end. They're already, you know, thumbing beads <laughs> through their fingers. Get rid of the Quran. Give them the Bible, yeah. you know, where it talks about the only way, you know, to heaven through Jesus Christ and have them, um, you know, in a certain sense, take their unashamedness to pray in public because they're not afraid. Those people are not afraid to pray in public and even wear, wear religion on their sleeve, literally. Um, imagine if we had a worldwide event a Guadalupe type event, right? We know what happened in the 16th century where Our Lady came in and converted like 10 million people to Catholicism, a whole civilization, because of a, a miraculous image on the Tilma. Imagine if we had something like that to happen today and we had massive amounts of Muslims convert to Christianity. I mean, it would be unbelievable. We would be put to shame immediately, brother, because these people would probably live it. Yep. They'd be super devout. They'd be praying those beads. They'd have modesty, you know, in their attire and in their dress. Um, they pray five just, times a day. They basically right. start doing the daily office. Right. We just have to shift their direction from Mecca, you know, right. uh, you know, to the east. Move. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, or, or towards the altar, you know. Right. Um, so, and there's there's other connections, you know, Fatima, for example. You know, what what is that all about? Well, a lot of people don't know that Fatima was one of the daughters of Muhammad. So when Our Lady came to Fatima, Portugal, you know, there could be a serious connection there. Ful Venerable Fulton Sheen talks about that, that maybe God is going to use the message of Fatima um, to convert the Muslims. Um, I pray for that. You know, yeah. I, I don't desire the death of any Muslim. I don't desire any bad for these people. I want them to know Jesus, yeah. right? I want them to experience the joy of the Eucharist. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And you know, Fatima, the message of Fatima is pray the rosary daily. That's right. That's right. Yep. So Our Lady saying, hey, here's your here's your assignment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think there's something I mean, I'm I'm speculating here. I, I don't know. I'm I'm not a prophet. I'm not Padre Pio or anything, but um, you know, if 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 I could come up with a way myself, you know, um that I could bring this about, you know what I would do? Man, I would send Our Lady to Mecca in an apparition, mm. standing on top of the Kaaba, the right. black box, <laughs> and in one arm holding the child Jesus, and then the mm. other a rosary. Yeah. Basically yeah. meaning take up the word and this form of prayer yes. and come home. Stop playing around, goofing yeah. off, coming up with these crazy ideas, and, you know, come home. Could happen. Yeah, I know a priest who once said, you know, if you look at the medieval area, you had the the Normans and the Vikings who were all, you know, persecuting that they were pagan. They're persecuting the Catholics of Europe, and then God converted them. Yeah, and they became right. the Normans, and they became great in the in the clergy and in in the Crusades and all sorts of roles. So it could be that our persecutors get converted and even one up us in their devotion to Christ. May it be right. so. May it be so. We should actually be praying for that on our rosaries. We should. We should. Because, you know, I think about that in, in, in light of our current situation in the world and in the church, right, with all the confusion, the chaos and division. I mean, I, I think it is going to take some kind of major event, biblical event, you know, of serious proportions to uh, shake us up and get us back. Could that mean the conversion of Islam to Christianity? Maybe. Maybe. Could be a meteor or a comet. Who knows, you know. But we need something. We need something. Yeah. What's the story on the uh, the bishop in Nigeria? Oh, yeah, this guy's amazing, and he's still alive. This is the incredible thing. And this just, well, it's 2019 now, so this would have happened uh, five years ago now, in 2014. So in Nigeria, which, you know, is really got a lot of problems with uh, militant Islamic groups, decapitating people, burning them alive in cages, yeah. horrible. So That's the Boko bishop, Haram group? Boko Haram yeah. is one of them, yep. Yeah. And... Um, so in his diocese, he was he didn't know what to do. He's like, my people are being decimated here. So he went to prayer with the rosary before the Blessed Sacrament in his in his chancery. And he says, and you can watch the videos, he says that during his prayer, Jesus appeared to him. And this is amazing to me because this just uh, I love this kind of stuff. Guess what Jesus had in his hands? A sword. A sword, right? Yeah. I mean, that's like in the, like, in the book of Revelation, he has a sword. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Because a lot of people got the wrong interpretation of Jesus. Oh, yeah. It's just some tree hugging hippie, kumbaya, yeah. let's all group hug, you know, yeah. small group breakout sessions. Nonsense, right? He is a warrior. The Lord is a warrior. Lord is his name, right? Um, that doesn't mean that he's Conan. Okay. Don't any of your listeners watch it. I'm not saying, you know, G Jesus said, put away the sword. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. But he also said, by I swords. Came. That, that's right. By swords. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So it's like, okay, interesting there. Now, what does it mean though? So when this bishop saw Jesus with the sword, he was just as startled as you and I would be seeing a vision like that. But Jesus didn't say anything. He had a gesture of handing the sword to his bishop. So the bishop uh, reached out his hand to take the sword from Jesus. As soon as he touched the sword, it was transformed into a rosary. Yeah, huge, huge statement there from Jesus. Yeah. And then Jesus talked and spoke three things. And he said, Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. Said it three times. And then the vision ended. The bishop, Bishop Oliver Dome is his name. He says he didn't need a prophet to tell him what the vision meant. Yeah. Jesus is telling him the rosary is a weapon. It's yeah. a sword. Use it. Unsheathe it. Go to battle with this weapon. Now, in that bishop's diocese, he started rosary crusades, which means parishes praying the rosary. So in his diocese, there has been an unbelievable defeat of Boko Haram. 700 of these soldiers surrendered their weapons shortly after this. A group of schoolgirls, I think it was 600, had been kidnapped. Like four, over 400 of them were, were returned so, shortly after this. Uh, so, And the bishop still gives testimony to this. He's still alive. It's amazing. We have to pray the rosary. Totally. You know, we have a lot of confusion in our time in the church with doctrine. Mm. And uh, people all over the ground are confused. I read this in the New York Times. I read this in the Washington Post. Uh, we have this whole situation, um, the aftermath of ex-Cardinal McCarrick mm -hmm. scandal. 
Uh, some priests say attendance is up at their parishes. Some say attendance is down. Everybody says giving is down. Mm. Uh, the Pope has been sending messages. The USCCB just had a big retreat. It, it's kind of a rough time, isn't it, Father? Oh, there's no doubt. You'd have to be living in another cosmos not to be aware of what's going on. I mean, it's pretty bad. It's pretty yes. bad. I'd say we're we're at pre-Renaissance levels of of disgust for the church, for clergy, even even not even though even the good ones. Mm. Um, I mean, the word bishop is almost like a pejorative now. He's a bishop. Right. That's how people talk. He's a bishop. Right. He's one of those bishops. Does Rosary help us here? I mean, what, Father, give us some guidance. Absolutely. To me, you know, the Rosary is an aspect of it. It's not the sole solution, of course, um, but it's a huge part of it because, I mean, you think about it, how much time, resources, money is wasted on coming up with strategic plans for, you know, evangelization or for helping our diocese get better. You know what would be huge? If a bishop, a bishop, just one man, if he led by example on his knees before the Blessed Sacrament, showing his people, his chancery, and his soldiers, his boys with the collars on, that he's a man of prayer, praying 20 minutes, 20 minutes? You can do this, right? I mean, Fulton Sheen did this. There's a picture. I have a sweet picture on my phone of Fulton Sheen as a bishop praying with the people in his staff. Every day he did it, the rosary. I mean, that's a huge statement because I guarantee you, if you do that, your meetings are going to be shorter because you're going to come to resolutions quicker. God's going to you know, enhance your fruitfulness if you take time for prayer. You know, I was just mentioning this the other day with somebody. You know, I said there was a bishop who's a saint, St. Anthony Mary Claret. Yes. Right? Yeah. This dude was awesome. We talked about him so, last week on the show. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, he, he was from Spain, but he ended up becoming a bishop in Santiago, Cuba, right? And Our Lady actually appeared to him on several occasions. It's in his autobiography. And she said that you will be the new St. Dominic for your times, right? Now, once again, Our Lady doesn't promote legends, okay? So she was telling him, basically, that the tradition is true, and you're going to be the new St. Dominic in promotion of the rosary. So what did he do? He mandated in his diocese in Cuba— that every priest was to pray the rosary with their people in their churches on Sundays and solemnities. And he would go around to churches and make sure it was being done. He would walk in the back. If it wasn't happening, he would march right up to the front and he'd do it himself. That's a leader. That's a guy you want to follow into combat. That, you know, nobody wants to follow Pee Wee Herman into battle. You know what I'm saying? You want I to don't. follow Braveheart. Yeah. You want to follow the guy with the sword. That's right. Right. No, right. you don't slay a dragon without a sword. So if you and ain't a got guy a sword, who has a plan, who has a plan, yeah, this is a that's plan. Right. right. So to me, you know, this is huge. The rosary is a big part of it. There has to be solid preaching as well, of course. And the bishop, man, you could light souls up if you took advantage of that opportunity. You got a pulpit that you've got, you know, people are listening to you. You could fire those souls up, man. And here's the other thing. Now, I wrote about this in one of my books. You know the game of chess, right? It, it, it's basic. So it's it's black and white. It's all about the king. Everybody knows this, you know. Um, but not a lot of people know that the game of chess comes out of a Catholic culture. Um, it, chess predates Christianity, but the way that we play it today, it comes out of a, a Catholic culture. So you, it's, you got the king, you got the queen, you got bishops, rooks, pawns, kind of vocations in the church. Now, it's all about the king. Everybody knows this. But on the board, the queen has the most mobility. She can move any number of squares in any direction. And to fight for the queen is to fight for the king. If you lose the queen, game over, right? But what most people don't know is that all that it takes on that battlefield is one bishop, just one. If he works with the queen, you can conquer the enemy in four moves. Is the new right? evangelization ain't rocket science, brother. All you got to do is <laughs> unleash the queen. Right. Right. With the bishop. With the bishop. Exactly. And here's the thing. Don't be afraid of being taken out of the game. You can come back in and you'll even be stronger than you were before. Right. right? Be willing to lay down your life for the king and the queen because that's that's what it's all about. And so that's the method. That's the model for the new evangelization for, for conquering souls for Jesus is to 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 work with our lady, whether you're a bishop or a rook or pawn, a knight, whatever it may be. But especially the bishops, especially. 
you made a connection just now about your preaching or the bishop or the priest preaching and the rosary. And I will say that the priests that I've known who are devoted to the rosary and preach the rosary are the good preachers. Right. They break open the word of God. They inspire us to follow Jesus, to become his disciples. It's also notable that the order of preachers, the Dominicans, are also the advocates of the rosary, the ones who received that gift right. from St. Dominic. So the order of preachers, St. Dominic, preaching the rosary, they go hand in hand. So fathers, yeah. priests, if you're, if you're a preacher, pray that rosary. We need it. We need you to pray the rosary. Because mm -hmm. what are you doing? You're just meditating on the gospel. Right, right. In, and, in the presence and, of Our Lady. Yeah. And look at the patron saint of priest, St. John Vianney, right? That little frail French dude scared the daylights out of Satan, <laughs> you know? I mean, that was not an intimidating looking dude, you know? But spiritually, the devil was terrified of that man. He actually said to him on one occasion, if there were a few more priests like you, I would have no power. Really? That little French dude? Yeah, because he was super devoted to the Eucharist, to the rosary. He loved the rosary. He promoted the rosary confraternity. Um, he promoted uh, the uh, Living Rosary Association of St. Philomena, started by uh, Pauline Gericault in France. He was a friend of hers. So, you know, you don't have to be articulate. You don't have to be the most eloquent. You don't have to be the most educated. But if you're faithful and you're a, a man on your knees, you'll have power. Uh, what would you say to people who are watching and maybe they, you know, they pray the rosary with grandma or maybe they'll pray at church if someone's praying the rosary, but they haven't taken the rosary and placed it into a plan of life. And by a plan of life, I mean, you say, all right, every two weeks or a month, I go to confession. Uh, mm -hmm. I go to mass every Sunday. Uh, and then in your daily life, I make an examination of conscience at night, like basically being intentional about being a follower of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the people who have not said, I want to pray a daily rosary. I'm going to place a time every day, whether it's in the morning or before bed or before dinner. Mm -hmm. They haven't done it yet. Yeah. But appeal to those people why it's important that they actually make it a 365 day a year practice. Yeah. Uh, I mean, basically because, you know, like lifting weights, you're going to get stronger, you know, as you do it. Maybe you're not going to start out, you know, benching some massive amount. Okay. That's understood. That's, that's legit. But don't let that deter you, you know, because that, that happens to a lot of people. It, it's kind of normal. I mean, I remember back in the day, I'd go to the gym. I, if I wasn't Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger tomorrow, I was like, eh, forget this, you know. I expected immediate results. That's just not how it works. Well, it's the same thing with acquiring virtue, turning away from sinful habits, and, you know, certain things in life that are harmful to us. You got to start somewhere. So even if it starts with just praying a decade a day, and then you can build that up. And then before long, you're going to find yourself praying an entire rosary a day, meaning one set of mysteries. But then you may be like, you know what? I can squeeze in another one. You know, I got to, I got to drive home from work that takes 30 minutes off, 20 of it. I'll pray the rosary. And before long, it becomes such a pattern in your life that um, you kind of uh, you feel like your day is not complete unless you do it. Um, actually, it was St. Alphonsus de Liguori. Um, who in his old age, he started to kind of lose his mental faculties a little bit. He would actually ask people, did I pray my rosary today? You know, it meant so much to him that he wanted to make sure that he got it in. And that guy's a doctor of the church. You yeah. Know? yeah. So it's a good example. Yeah. I would say as a father of a large family too, that the family rosary is absolutely critical in raising your children in the faith. Mm -hmm. So many people who are committed to the church, committed to the church, say, I remember praying the rosary with my parents. Yeah. And you're you're passing on the faith. You're passing on devotion to Our Lady, the mysteries, all those things. So dads and moms commit to a family rosary. And I, I think the best way to do it is you have dinner, and then everybody helps put the dishes up or bring things to the kitchen. And then we have a little bit of downtime and then get the littlest ones in their pajamas. And if they're, if they're not too wiggly... You know, they can stay there. If they need to go to bed, they can go to bed with the older kids. And then do a rosary. And maybe if they're wiggly and you look at you do one decade, you did a decade. Right. And maybe right. if not, maybe you get two or three. As a parent, just make the call. Tonight's a one decade. It's okay. 
Right? That's right. Especially when you have little, you know, three year olds and one year olds and <laughs> even seven year olds sometimes, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes teenagers, let me tell you, uh, <laughs> get distracted. Even I get distracted. So just try it. Just say, if we get one decade in, that's just a couple minutes, like, you know, two, three minutes. But it's time where you as a family pray together uh, before Our Lady, and it will change your, your family. It'll protect your family, which is what we really need right now. We need protection from yeah. the devil on our families. And so the rosary, you can't get an exorcism every day, but you can pray the rosary every day. That's right. And, you know, and the benefits of it, I mean, um, when you pray a family rosary, it specific, specifically says this in the book of indulgences that you get a plenary indulgence. I mean, hello. I mean, what what more could you want for your children than to get a, an indulgence like that for them? You know, I mean, we never know when we're going to die. We never know when that's going to happen. So to have that is just incredible. But then also, you know, studies have been shown um, that if a if in the home, it's the father who leads by example when it comes to prayer. It has staying power. It sticks more because then they think, well, that was just mom's thing. It's just a woman's thing. Now I'm free. I'm not under the roof. You know, I can do my own thing. But if they see that example in their father, studies have shown it sticks. They'll tend to go to church even after they leave home. They'll tend to keep up these practices even when they're out of the house. So that's huge. It is. And hopefully keep up praying the rosary. Yeah, right. You know, right. It, it, and as a parent, you can, you know, if you're in the car, maybe you're doing a two hour drive, pull the rosary out of your pocket. And your teenager goes, Oh, I got to pray the rosary. Yeah, we're going to pray the rosary. Come on. It's no big deal. Right. It's worth it. Do yeah, it. Yeah, it is. Do it. And to be real with it, too, because, you know, I mean, St. Louis de Montfort talks about this, and I'm glad that he does. You know, nobody has ever prayed a perfect rosary. You know, we do not have angelic intellect that can just penetrate one thing and stick on it for 20 minutes. You're going to think about what's that smell or, oh, did I respond to that email or, you know, normal, that's going to happen. St. Therese of Lisieux, right? Everybody loves a little flower. She struggled to pray the rosary. You know, she get distracted. We all do. But if you keep at it, you keep bringing your mind and your heart back to the mysteries. It's what I call giving God butterfly kisses, right? Yeah. You you would accept every little distracted kiss that your daughter gave to you, right? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Right. So does God the Father. Even you know, we're, we're children to him. We, we get distracted, but as long as we come back and give him a little peck on his divine face, you know, with uh, getting our mind back on the mystery, he'll take all of them. Yeah. Yep. Well, Father, thank you so much for this time. Uh, I've learned a lot, and your book is excellent. I haven't finished reading it, and I skipped around a little bit in it just to get get a feel for it, and uh, it's really good. It's it's short, too. What is yeah. How long is this? 162 or 162 pages. So, I mean, you can you can read it in a few a few sittings. Um, anything else you'd like to share? I mean, you're, you're, you've become over the years an, an apostle of the rosary. It's wonderful. We need more priests that way. But um, anything else you want to share? Maybe relating to the crisis or people who are discouraged. And some people are saying they're not even going to church anymore, which to me is crazy. I mean, if yeah. the ship's sinking, you don't jump off the ship. <laughs> That's sharks. right. No, but I mean, know. But what would you say to people? Yo, know, I would say to them using that same analogy. I mean, uh, you know, in the days of Noah, um, you had to be in that saving ark to, to, you know, make it. Now, in that ark, there was a lot of animals, which meant there was a lot of other stuff in there. It yeah. stinks. Right now yeah. in the church, it stinks, man. I mean, it's it's deep. You're going to step in it every now and then. It's going to get on you. And it's um, it's not good. It's not pretty. But don't jump. Don't jump. You know, if you do, you're not going to make it. And uh, we just got to pray through this. Our Lady will get us through this. And um, pray for us priests because it's not easy. It's not. Oh, man, it's not. It's it's tough. I'm working on a special project right now that I would ask all the listeners and viewers to uh, please pray for. Um, I can't reveal the topic yet because I, I don't want it to be revealed so somebody else tries to do it before me and jacks it up and doesn't do it right, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on this project. So uh, I'll be in touch with you, Taylor, about it in the future and uh, get people excited about it. It's going to be awesome. Very cool. Very cool. And the great thing about the rosary, folks, is, you know, our, our king is Jesus. Our queen is Mary. You just talked about that. And when it comes to rosary, you don't, you don't need a cardinal or a bishop or whoever, a priest, deacon, religious, to pray the rosary. Right. Right. It's this intimate prayer. It binds us to the heart of the church. Um, and in a way, we can, we can be with Our Lady. We can be with Our Lord. We can pray the Our Father. We can experience adoption of sons 
in Christ. All these beautiful mysteries happened in the rosary. And so I think it's kind of a way for in a crisis when, you know, maybe you live in a diocese and there is a major scandal, right? Or maybe you're in a diocese in the world and the bishop does have to resign. The rosary is this sacramental. It's not a sacrament, but it's a sacramental that puts you right into the presence of divine realities, heavenly realities. So it's wonderful. Yeah, you nailed it. And that's true. And in in England, when there was great persecutions, they had the rosary. You know, it got them through the tough times. Think about in Vietnam when there was like a quarter of a million martyrs. They were in the woods doing what? Praying the rosary. And Our Lady came, Our Lady of Le Bang, you know. And so the rosary, it'll get us through these tough times. Absolutely. Great. Well, uh, everybody, pray the rosary every day. And Father, would you mind ending us with a, a prayer and a blessing? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of uh, the rosary, the gift of uh, Our Lady. We ask you to bless all the listeners, viewers, their intentions, and our church in this difficult time. And we ask this blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, Father Donald Calloway, thank you so much. Everybody get his book, Ten Wonders of the Rosary. All right. God bless. You too.